Okay, here we go. Elements of architecture. And uh, this is how I experience uh, much of the research in the literature. Um, so there are certain architectural elements that repeat. <coughs> and uh, you know these structures arguably are all beautiful, um, or in case of neural networks, useful. And then you know you you uh, people sort of mix and copy a little bit of things they have seen elsewhere, and uh, it's very successful <laughs> empirically, if maybe not so satisfying, you know, theoretically, because uh, you know let's say there is not such a thing as an optimal cathedral, uh, but but there might be such a thing as an optimal network and. Currently, it's not at all clear how to go from a good network to a better network. Uh, this is uh, a very empirical process these days. Okay, uh, let's start, you know, historically uh, with the AlexNet. Um, so here's uh, the proper reference. This is 2012. And this was uh, the breakthrough paper for neural networks in modern computer vision. And uh, let's look at this in detail. We here have an input image of size, you know, 224 by 224 pixels and three channels, the red, the green, and the blue channel. Uh, then a small filter. At, at that time, they still use pretty large filters, you know, size 11 by 11 uh, was used. And this filter was used not densely, but you see here by a stride of four. So um, we had a reduction by a factor of four in both X and Y direction between this layer and the next. And the result is an image of size, you know, considering boundary effects and all, uh, that would be an image of size 55 by 55. And uh, not merely one filter is being learned, but 48 of them. Um, then at the next stage, another convolution is performed. This time the filters are five by five in X and Y direction, and they encompass all features. So it's five by five by 48. And Sorry, it's not a filter, but it's a max pooling stage. Um, so this means, sorry, rewind a little bit. Um, this means that um, how do the dimensions match up? I think it's two things happening on the, yep, it's two things happening. On the one hand, um, there are these um, filters which are five by five in X and Y and which depend on all 48 features. And then from the result out of uh, two by two pixels, only the strongest response is being kept. Yeah? So this is the max, so-called max pooling. And this gives me an image of size 27 by 27. And in this case, 128 different filters or features were learned. Okay, and then the same is repeated. So it's convolutions, max pooling, convolutions. Um, at this point here, the image is a mere 13 by 13 pixels. And now we have 128 channels. So we have become, um, ex we have now have an extremely coarse spatial resolution, but we have many feature channels to somehow encode the image content at those relatively few locations. And here the, uh, the aim was image classification. So the final output, um, which I would prefer to draw in this direction, um, the final output, if you like, is a one by one image with uh, 1000 channels 
1,000 channels because we have 1,000 different classes. And the idea is to just get a strong response in a given channel that corresponds to a given class. So now we need to go from this low resolution image to this uh, single pixel image. And this happens uh, here by means of these fully connected layers. So here now we have real perceptrons. So we have uh, uh, 2048 perceptrons. And each perceptron has as input has has as input this entire block here. Yeah. So each perceptron has, let's figure this out, has 13 by 13 by 128 inputs and as many weights. That's for a single perceptron, but now we have um, 2048 of these. Yeah? So there are a lot of a, param a lot of parameters hidden in this so-called dense layer here. And then we have another dense layer, so another single pixel image with 2048 channels and uh, another dense layer in softmax. So overall, we have gone from an image to a one hot vector encoding. And um, I here try to summarize in a picture of this architecture and others. Uh, so my image here has two axes. Uh, one axis I've called um, the scale of the image and the other is uh, the depth in my network. And we start with an image. So the real input dimensions were 224 by 224, but I'm ignoring this uh, and I'm saying that uh, these were uh, 256 by 256. Okay. Um, then uh, we have, as you see, uh, then we reduce by a stride, uh, we reduce uh, thanks to this stride of four. Um, our image goes down in resolution to just 64 by 64 pixels and we end up here. And I've tried to encode in the size of the circle the number of features. So here it was 48 features. Um, then in the next step, we have this max pooling so we, re we reduce the pixels by a factor of two in X and Y, but now we have even more features. So my circle becomes bigger. And then we re reduce by another factor of two. And then we stay at the same resolution. Here we stay at the same resolution for a while. So these are the next three layers of my network. And then finally uh, comes the spatial collapse. So I go to an image with just a single pixel but very, very, very many features. And the same for the next layer. And then finally comes my output. And um, it is uh, this output <clears throat> that I now compare with the ground truth. And this is why I put a red dot here to say that this is where loss enters the system, or this is where I inject gradient. Yeah, so if we look at this from a distance, uh, then we see that in this kind of plot here, my network um, starts, uh, again, I cannot change colors. My network starts here and it somehow, you know, gradually reduces dimensionality until we end up here uh, in the single pixel resolution, which is no resolution. Uh, and we inject loss at this stage and then we back propagate to adjust the parameters such that my output is as close as possible to the desired output. And now when we look at this, you know, many, many other choices would have been possible. Yeah? So um, why should we not use more features here or less features? Or, um, you know, would it not have been better to continue a little bit here and then go down and maybe make the network a little bit deeper and uh, you know inject loss only at this stage, etc. Yeah? So uh, each path that you can invent through this diagram corresponds to one network architecture and they're all legit. Um, the guiding questions are, uh, will they fit into your GPU memory wise and uh, well, who has had you know good or bad experiences with a comparable architecture before? Um, 
and uh, so I was I was there when this uh, paper was presented, and and then there was the question, you know, why why seven layers, hidden layers, and then the answer was, well, we tried six and eight, and seven worked best, yeah? and uh, and this has ultimately not changed since. Yeah? So it's still a very um, empirical uh, business, but it works great. Um, so here uh, is an image which is by now uh, you know, iconic from this paper. You see various pictures from this ImageNet uh, collection. And then you see um, below um, the, the strongest outputs of the network and what the network thinks it sees. Um, so, for example, the network thinks that uh, it's either a mite with this much probability and with smaller probability it's a black widow and with even smaller it's a cockroach and then a tick, which is interesting, right? So, um, it is a mite, so the ground truth is mite. But the next detections, so black widow is a, is a spider and cockroach is, is also an insect and, and tick is also, no, not an insect, but uh, from the spider family. Um, so, you know, somehow even the errors are kind of meaningful. Uh, and uh, now this was correct here. It is very confident that it is a container ship. So you see, you know, the, the bar here is very long and indeed it is a container ship. Um, so on the top row are success cases. In the bottom row are so-called failures. For example, the network thinks it's a convertible, which is perfectly correct. But the ground truth was grill, which is, you know, just this front part here. So it's not really a mistake is the bottom line. Yeah? Or um, here the network is very confident that it sees a Dalmatian, uh, but the ground truth says, no, it's cherry. Yeah, whatever. I mean, they were, of course, handpicked, you know, the, the, the bad cases, <laughs> but uh, they, I think they made their point very nicely. Okay, so... Uh, and this comes from a lab, so uh, Geoffrey Hinton has made contributions at the forefront of neural networks for the last 30 years, even in the, especially in the 20 years or 25 years when nobody believed <laughs> in this. So, uh, a lot of stamina. Okay, uh, the next network I mention is called VGG16. And uh, I'm mentioning it, you know, it's a second generation network uh, it's much deeper, so more layers. It no longer fits into my nice uh, square diagram. And, you know, you can just trust me. I looked at the table and then somehow translated this into, uh, into the diagram here. Uh, you see this pattern that there are always uh, three convolutions and then comes a max pooling and then another three convolutions and a max pooling and so on. And uh, I am mentioning it because um, somewhere in there, close uh, towards the end, it has these uh, one-dimensional representations. So in other words, my input image is now simply represented <coughs> as a long, the entire image is represented as a feature vector. And these uh, feature vectors have uh, 4096 elements. And uh, these days, if you just need features for an image or an image patch, uh, don't want to think too much, then people will just use a pre-trained VGG16 and then uh, uh, chop it off uh, here, chop off the last layer, and then use the 4096 features as descriptor. And you see that this was proposed for image classification, but you can as well use it uh, on image patches. And uh, you can also implement this in a convolutional fashion so that you will not get a single vector output for the entire image, but a single vector output for every pixel or, or every patch in your image. Um, number of parameters, 138 million. So this is something that was, you know, a few years back inconceivable to train a machine learning method with uh, 140 million parameters and, and successfully at that. Um, this was from the Tisherman lab. 
now um, to implement this. Uh, and that's also something you will see in the exercises. Um, there is now the sort of convenience functionality. Um, here I show a little bit code for a convenience library which builds on top of TensorFlow, which is called TensorFlow Slim. And you know this here is the core thing, so which specifies the architecture. So if we look closely, um, you see that uh, here we want to get 64 features, uh, each of which uh, take as input a three by three patch from the previous image. And then we take 128 features also from the three by three. Uh, and then at some point down there, um, we have the fully convolutional part with these uh, 4096. And then there are more things specified, uh, you know, certain, thi certain things uh, concerning the optimization. But it's, you know, such a network can be represented or coded in a pretty compact fashion. This was VGG16. Any questions? Yeah? Uh, is it possible that uh, the mm, more deep the network is, then the more probability to get a worthy profit? Mm, so in, in general, yes, when you have too many parameters, you will get overfitting. Um, as you make it deeper, probably the first problem that you encounter is one of vanishing gradients, which has plagued the field for a long time. And several of the tricks that I'm showing in the next uh, try to address this vanishing gradient problem. More questions? Yes? Did the original VGG16 actually use dropout? I thought it was I have no idea. You will know better than I. <laughs> Okay. More questions? Well, would the understand this why we say that, uh, uh, I mean, we end in a one dimensional mm -hmm. uh, image? Mm -hmm. Over each, I mean, we don't have uh, for each pixel uh, probability. Which class it yes, so for image classification, we just get a vector for the entire image, which tells me for each class represented by this vector, you know, with which probability is it present in the image. Okay, so mm -hmm. and in the, in the previous example with the Alex net, yes. were the same thing? Yes, both, so both AlexNet and this original VGG16 were for image classification, where the input is an image and the output is just a single vector saying is a given class present in the image or not. More questions? Okay. Then semantic segmentation. Now, this is not a network that anybody would use, just to make the point. Yeah. So in semantic segmentation, I want to uh, input my data at uh, a given resolution. And the output should be an image with capital K channels, if I have cap capital K classes. And my baseline would just be this, you know, I compute features and some nonlinear transformation and more features and nonlinear transformation. And I would just stay on this horizontal line. And, you know, actually that works, you know, it's not, it's not terrible. But um, there is something that works much better in the very popular architecture nowadays, which is the unit from uh, Olaf Ronneberger. Um, here, uh, the picture tells you why it is called a unit, yeah, because it goes down and then up again in resolution. And uh, in, the, in the kind of graph that I've shown here, uh, it's the same thing. Um, so uh, here it looks very much like a VGG16, yeah? so three convolutions, downsampling, three convolutions, downsampling. And at this stage, there is an upsampling happening, which is possible, right? Upsampling is also a linear operation. It can be followed by nonlinear activation. 
uh, upsampling, upsampling. Um, this network would already do okay, but uh, a really nice feature are these skip connections, uh, which means that um, here these perceptrons get input from here, <coughs> but they also get input from there. Yeah? So from earlier on at the network, uh, but at the same resolution. And now when I say gets input from, you know, I have two arrows converging on the same lattice point here. I have two fundamental ch choices. Um, so when uh, two flows of information converge, um, I can either concatenate or I can add. And we see both things in the literature. Uh, in the case of the unit, it is a concatenation. Yeah, so what you see here, for example, I have uh, 52, well, I have some, this blue part here is a function of that, a linear transformation, upsampling, nonlinear transformation, and then I also have this uh, carrying over of uh, previous results, which is represented by this box. Yeah, so here they have been concatenated, which means I double the number of features. If I, ha if I had added them, I would not have doubled the number of features, but I would have lost some information, of course. Okay, so these skip links are really important. And um, now the folklore explanation for what's going on in the network is to say that we have a geometric pathway and a semantic pathway. Um, the semantic pathway, as you can see, is much deeper. Yeah? As, I, as, I follow, as I follow the valley here, um, my data, my input data sees many more layers. And arguably, this lets me understand what I see in a given part of the image. And the geometric pathway, which is much shallower, tells me, okay, I've understood what it is, but where precisely is it? So up until which pixel uh, does a specific object extend? Uh, and you see that the geometric pathway is much shallower, which also makes sense from a memory budget point of view, because uh, uh, you know, we have very limited RAM in our GPU. And of course, the high resolution images and features that we compute at high resolution take up much more RAM than um, the very many features that I can compute down here on extremely low resolution images. And so what we see here is a, is a trade-off of where do you want to spend your RAM budget. And this network spends it, spends it you know, somehow evenly between the geometric and semantic, but in this way, the semantic gets much more depth. And this has been a very influential idea and is a very, you know, generally useful kind of architecture if you're interested in semantic segmentation. Now, I want to introduce um, just two more ideas. Um, before we finish for today. Uh, well, one idea in two papers. Um, this is the first paper that advertised the uh, use of site losses, or the first paper that I know, uh, called Holistically Nested Edge Detection. Um, I've only sketched the architecture here very roughly, um, but the thing is, that you do not only inject loss at the very end of the network, but you try and encourage these intermediate stages of the network to already do something useful. And uh, this, on the one hand, helps regularize the network, but it also helps uh, propagate gradient into the very early layers. Um, if you remember the back propagation, when we do when we do back propagation, we multiply Jacobians, and if my Jacobian has small numbers, 
if I multiply many of them, then I multiply many small numbers and I get out values very close to zero. And that means it just takes a very long time for the early layers to learn anything useful at all. And uh, this use of side losses here helps. <coughs> um, so let's look at pretty pictures here. Um, the ground truth, you know, you can argue how much sense it makes yeah, that these are the meaningful edges in the image. Uh, but in any case, you see that uh, the intermediate layers already try to produce a edge detection, which is good according to ground truth. And then uh, the final output of the network here is actually very good. So this was a big uh, leap in edge detection accuracy compared to earlier work. Do these architectures tune end-to-end structures? Is it end-to-end -end, uh, trained? Is that the question? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes it is. Mm -hmm. So if we look at the picture here, okay, we have these successive uh, downsampling stages and each of these side outputs is matched against the ground truth. And then also uh, all of these are fused to predict the real thing, which is, uh, well, that point there. I think the idea is clear. And if you look at the order, uh, the order is Zuoven2, who uh, a few years earlier introduced a method called auto context and that is a very general idea and has also been picked up by the neural network community. Um, the idea in outer context is to, in semantic segmentation, to use uh, some classifier repeatedly, uh, but to augment the input that it sees with the output of the previous iteration. So uh, we have here some classifier and the classifier outputs a semantic segmentation. And now the next network gets both the raw image and the tentative semantic segmentation as input and tries to improve upon it and produces a new semantic segmentation. And then the original image with the new semantic segmentation is, fit into, uh, is fed into the next unit and this is repeated typically you know maybe three or four times that's the big idea of outer context and now there would be many ways of how to implement it in terms of neural network um, here is one way called the stacked hourglass networks um, okay i'm skipping i'm skipping the details here uh, i want to show you a a picture from a different paper which analyzes this effect of now using side losses because again here the question is uh, do I only want to couple this output to a loss or do I not also try and encourage my intermediate outputs to already do something useful and it turns out yes that is useful and here is a plot from uh, a paper called convolutional pose machines and uh, what we see from left to right are different layers of the network where um, stage one, stage two, stage three are um, the different units or modules used in outer context. And we see histograms of the amount of gradient flowing. In red, we see the histograms of uh, you know, like the title says, the histogram of the gradient magnitude during training. And if we only inject uh, supervision here, so if we only uh, couple the very output of the network uh, to the ground truth, then we see in red that uh, we have a decent uh, gradient flow here in the last layers, but uh, you know, practically zero gradient in the early layers, almost zero. Yeah, the, red is, the histogram is extremely peaked around zero. Whereas if we 
introduce side losses or if we introduce supervision at all of these locations, then we get the black histogram and you see that we now have gradient flowing nicely at all stages and this holds also over several epochs. And then uh, they show in the paper in terms of numbers that you that using the side losses, you do get much better accuracy. Yeah, I don't show the plot here. Well, and the result is, uh, you know, key point detection that works very well. So here we would see for some tennis player heat maps for left shoulder, left elbow, left wrist, left knee, or right knee and right ankle. Um, and using neural networks here has hugely improved um, the accuracy of pose estimation. Good. Um, I am not at all done with my uh, architectural ideas, um, but you see certain uh, recurrent themes here. It's good to have a strongly downsampled version of the image such that even a small filter can have a large effective spatial context. Um, it uh, can make sense to use a network out of context style. It does make sense to introduce side losses. And these are useful ideas if you want to build systems that do something for you. Enough for today. See you next week.